Welcome to the stage, the one and only Wayne Chang from Spruce, talking to us today about the roadmap for Web3 Identity. Roadmap for Web3 Identity. And it's the idea that not your keys, not your crypto can evolve to not your keys, not your identifier, not your data. You can control a lot more things digitally with your keys than just your cryptocurrencies. So basically, if we see Web3 as the singular most successful form of decentralized identity ever, just due to the vast adoption of key pairs everywhere, right? That's what these projects like GPG wanted to do, um, where we saw a lot of efforts, how do we get more keys into people's hands, because that allows them to exert more control digitally, right? Because today, a lot of the time, you have to sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook, it takes away a lot of autonomy. Right? If uh, Google were to take away your identifier, it's not just Google services that you lose access to, it's anything you ever signed in using Google for, right? it's gone. So they can rug you in different ways, and using our keys and basing control on that, we can move beyond Web2 identity and simple SSO, and one of the recent collaborations with the Ethereum Foundation and ENS that Spruce has been working on is sign in with Ethereum. If you have an existing Ethereum account, and when we say sign in with Ethereum, we mean sign in with EVM, uh, any chain ID, you can use your existing account to authenticate into a service, whereas you typically would have signed in with Google, signed in with Facebook, now you can sign in with Ethereum. And we see this as one of the most important steps to unbundle the login. <clears throat> Today, there are a few entities that have basically end-to-end -end control of the login experience, from the authentication to what data is shared, how you enrich the session and provide scopes and information, right? Uh, for example, if you wanted to bring in more data as part of your login, uh, you would have to convince a product manager at one of these companies to probably turn it on for everyone to add more OpenID Connect scopes or anything like that, right? So if we really just boil down the login to its core components, starting with open authentication that's based on a key pair, then you're able to build it back up again with every step along the way. Uh, data from public sources in the blockchain. Once you authenticate someone, uh, you can understand you know, if they have chain activity, for example, if you go to OpenSea and you want to change your profile, let's say update your alias or PFP, uh, they don't want to just let anyone do that, right? They want to make sure that they're actually talking to the key holder behind an Ethereum account or smart contract. So they make you sign a message that says you're logging into OpenSea, you know, sign this to show that you actually hold the key. And um, they also have some nice kind of security protections too, like a nonce in there to prevent replay attacks. Um, but uh, basically, you want to have this flow because, uh, again, you want to know who you're talking to. Then you can establish a session, see what NFTs the user owns, and get on with it. Um, but we think that that's just the beginning, and there's so much more possible, right? We want to move from a world where uh, users have to log into platforms, the platforms have to log into the user's data vault, and you can revoke access any time to the platform. Right, that's the direction we want to move, and we think by just unbundling this, allowing the user to define the end-to-end -end experience, we provide these open interfaces each step along the stack, and you can have uh, more competitive and more diverse opinions and projects plugging in. So that's how we see Web3 Identity evolving, uh, stripping it down to the core components of what is a login, what's the whole experience, and making sure that we can build it up with open interfaces. So once we have uh, identity, right, and I think what's really interesting is if you're talking to a Web3 DAP, you're going to that website, you're um, basically not even able to save light mode or dark mode, right? Uh, you maybe have it in your local storage in your browser, but what about across your different devices? How do you make sure that you, know, you, can, you can do that? Um, more advanced forms of that are being able to remember your token lists across different DEXs and other preferences across DAPs, even loading in some JavaScript to uh, enhance your DAP experience exactly how you want to, right? Um, this stuff is possible once you're able to bring storage from users. And uh, right now, it's really difficult because no DAP wants to host a Postgres server, right? So how do we get to that nice UX that everyone likes from Web2? Well, if the user brings their own data vaults, so you can store it there and you can retrieve it, right? So I'll tell you how we get there with signing with Ethereum. And uh, other parts of decentralized identity that are slowly evolving, just trends that we're seeing, we're going from surface level data, like ownerships of accounts. Uh, if you're familiar with Keybase, excellent project. Unfortunately, uh, not a blog post in several months, but uh, after the Zoom acquisition, but you know, they started to be able to associate your existing social graphs 
to your key material, right? So you could have your public key, you know, tied in, and I'm sure if you've been on crypto Twitter, then you've seen everyone asserting that, hey, you know, my Ethereum address is this, my other blockchain address is that, to try to anchor their identifier over to uh, their social graph, right? And that theory is that if you have a bunch of like weakly linked graphs and you overlay them on each other, that's actually a pretty strong identifier. And you can use that for a lot of use cases, especially civil attack prevention and that kind of stuff. Um, as we get more and more integrated, right, we can imagine that you can use your DAO activity in different contexts. We can enhance those with zero knowledge proof so that you can uh, selectively disclose, you know, I'm part of this DAO, but I won't tell you which membership ID I have, right? There's a lot of this kind of work ongoing right now with projects like Sysmo and uh, Tornado Cash Doll Solutions. Um, as we can graft onto more Web2 APIs like LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, Adobe for creators, right? You can figure out how to port your resume um, certifications, places you've worked at, code that you've written into credentials that you can bring around with you and, you know, apply for the right DAO job. That helps us enable and create a much more fluid uh, workforce. Even your cross-chain activity, it looks a lot like trying to export data from LinkedIn when you're going from one chain to another because they're just separate disparate systems and that's why we have multi-sig bridges as mentioned earlier so that we can anchor the trust across the two systems. And then, <clears throat> you know, I think as we get even further, you can get Web2 APIs in general to become trusted data faucets in Web3. So anything there could be projected into Web3 in a safe and private manner and can be reused in building blocks with smart contracts. So I'm gonna go over some key technologies that are really gonna make this transition easier. The first one is session keys. So if we wanna root more of our actions in our keys, right, one of the really big UX issues is uh, wallets. Uh, imagine you, we made a Dropbox-like thing and you had to sign every kind of interaction against uh, you know, your wallet, right? That would be really painful every time you rename a file, every time you drag and drop a file. That's horrible at UX and you know, you're likely to not have great user retention. But what we can do is we can spawn a new key on the spot from the system entropy and put it in the DOM, and that's horrifying because the DOM is a horrible place to store a key. You can use iframes and other things, but let's just recognize it's worse security. So as a result, you get worse privileges. We, we can attenuate the privileges and make sure that um, we uh, have the key expiring by default, right? And a bunch of other security mechanisms to uh, make sure that that key is appropriately permissioned. Then the DOM and DAP can just use the key and create all these signings for different file operations, right? And that's much better UX. So that's Web2 level UX, and you, can, you probably can achieve uh, just as good security, if not better, than cookies. So um, through spec extensions with sign-in with Ethereum, with a lot of collaborators, not just Spruce, we are able to interpret the sign-in with Ethereum request as a key delegation. If you look into what sign-in with Ethereum uh, message format looks like, it looks a lot like a JOT or a JWT. Things like expiration date, not before usage, uh, you're able to scope it separate ways. So we can, we can make extensions to the specification to make it so that when you sign in with Ethereum, you get a session key, and that session key can be used to access a user's data vault. Right, so that's one of the technologies that a lot of people are getting excited about. Another technology that's very related is capabilities-based permissioning systems. This stuff was uh, kind of popular, I think, about 20, 30 years ago, but a lot of the systems like, kind of assumed that everyone would have PKI, right? And that just wasn't the case for a while. But now, maybe it is, and maybe we have another shot at it. If you're curious about a really early rendition of this system, there's one called uh, Keynote by Matt Blaze. It's an ITF RFC, and I think it was published in like the 90s. Uh, but again, we assume that everyone had key materials, but not many people do. Most people just have like a you know, key for their web server so they can do the TLS cert, and no one's really using it in a serious way past like some government systems. So um, now that we do have uh, public key infrastructure, basically, you know, we can revisit these models. What's capabilities-based permission as opposed to RBAC or role-based access control, right? Um, so maybe you're the administrator in a role-based system, you can do anything, you're a user, you can only edit your account. These are pretty rigidly defined roles and what the roles can do, right? Whereas a capability-based permission system works a lot more like a hall pass. If you go to a website and the website's like, how do I store a file with you, right? You can write a hall pass that says, okay, you can store a file with this content hash if you authenticate with a certain key pair. And I'm gonna sign off on this hall pass as the resource owner, right? You give the hall pass to the web service, they take the hall pass, countersign for it as requested, 
uh, upload the file, and the host will check that, one, did the resource owner issue this whole pass correctly? Two, does the content being uploaded match the hash? And three, was it authenticated correctly with the counterparty, right? And if that all goes through, then they can, they can have at it. One of the great things about the session keys earlier is that we can use session keys to issue these hall passes. So you can imagine a permissioning system working entirely within a user's Web3 wallet, and they never have to leave or download anything else, right? Because we figured out a lot of the supply chain here. Um, another interesting extension is the idea of programmable uh, capabilities. When you see capability systems, most people will talk about object capabilities. You refer to a specific thing. Like in a video game, it might be you can open this door, right? And that's the action against the thing and sign off on it. But if we have a programming language that can specify exactly what you can do, right, that's really interesting because uh, you can represent an infinite number of permissions and that's the kind of world we're in. There's just a lot of stuff that you can permission. So if you can implement a predicate that must execute before you know, whatever action is ran, I think that's a really interesting model. For example, step one, see who's countersigning for the capability or invoking it. Step two, interpret it as an Ethereum address and look on all their NFT ownership on Polygon, right? Step three, make sure that one of the following NFTs is in the set and you created NFT gated access, but you can layer on more stuff too. But that can go into a function, and then you, know, you can use the function again. I think it's a really interesting model because uh, you can permission a whole bunch of stuff. I think one really interesting realization is that when you're creating state in a blockchain, you're basically uh, creating uh, governance rules that may or may not be followed, right? Other smart contracts can read it and follow it, but what about off-chain stuff? Off-chain stuff can also read the rules and use that as sort of a root capability to understand who is the administrator of this whole system or you know, what's the access list, that kind of thing. And that really puts you know, token-gated access or balance-gated access into perspective. Verifiable credentials are probably a term that you'll hear a lot. Um, it's a standard from W3C, a global data standard that is JSON-based. Uh, so people... Uh, talk about it, um, you know, verifiable credentials, not NFTs, and there's a lot of back and forth about it. But I'm just gonna talk about, I'm gonna share my understanding of what a verifiable credential in is. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the W3C Verifiable Credentials Working Group, um, and uh, I've seen a lot of the discussions over the past few years in terms of, you know, what it is, what it isn't, what use cases people are using it for. It's broader than just Web3 and the blockchain industry. Um, a lot of people, <clears throat> including universities, are betting on verifiable credentials as the next way that we represent diplomas and such. Um, a lot of people are finding out, you know, can we have uh, verifiable credentials uh, like digital attestations to represent things like professional certificates, uh, you know, where you went to school, um, even a mobile driver's license. So <clears throat> uh, I believe that if you look at IBM's implementation of the COVID uh, digital passport in New York, they use something very close to verifiable credential and their other, in their broader general solutions, you know, this is used. So I'm just saying that like, this is broader than just Web3, but we can make it work really well with Web3. Well, what is it? It's uh, basically signed JSON, right? It can also be represented as a JOT if you're used to those. But there, <coughs> there's something called JSON-LD, which is an alternative form to represent and sign them as well. And it, it's a statement about reality, right? It's an attestation. You're saying that, oh, I went to this school, or maybe the university says that, hey, Wayne went to that school, right? And, um, or in Web3, you could say, hey, that's also my wallet. So uh, you can pay to that account instead of to my public account, right? And you're able to sign off on it, and people can see that you issued this. So um, basically, uh, with VCs, if we get it to work with blockchain wallets or just blockchain accounts, and what that really means is that we look at the Bitcoin curve uh, slash Ethereum curve, we look at curves that uh, other blockchains use, you can get them to interoperate with verifiable credentials, and then now you can make uh, digital attestations in a globally uh, standard data format, right? And that could be really powerful, especially if we understand a canonical representation from verifiable credential to an NFT, and then back again, can you project a limited subset onto the chain in a way that you know, pre preserves your privacy properly? Uh, those are some really interesting directions that we're seeing. So another thing that you've probably heard of, if you've heard of VCs, is decentralized identifiers. What are those, right? Well, the whole idea is that it is an identifier that has the potential for the user to fully control uh, or not. So decentralized identifiers have one job in life, and that's to resolve something called a did document. 
The DID document is also JSON, and it describes who controls this decentralized identifier, the so-called DID controller, right? And there are a bunch of ways to get to this DID document. The biggest question is, where does the div do DID document live? And it lives wherever the, the DID method says it lives, and there are hundreds, maybe not hundreds, but over 100 DID methods, right? So you have to pick the right DID method for your circumstance. And um, within Web3, we um, came up with one called DID PKH, or public key hash. And that uh, DID method just says that, hey, if you already have a, a blockchain account, great, check under your seats, you have DIDs, right? You just append your blockchain address to DID PKH prefix, and then you have a DID. Um, there are limitations to it, you can't rotate keys, you can't add service endpoints to do discovery or anything like that. But the whole point of decentralized identifiers is to create interoperability across all these different trust systems, right? So we can start with some, you know, DIDs that have less functionality for the right use cases, maybe even working as a session key, and then you can basically graph them onto other DID methods and create more stable identifiers for long-term use. For example, what if we took an ENS name and we said that's your, you know, human-readable DID, and you can use a bunch of Ethereum accounts specified by the ENS domain, or sorry, ENS name to, uh, do authentication, right? Then you have key rotation. So there's a lot of things we can do with DIDs. We can't think of them as, you know, there's only one way to do it. There are a bunch and there will continue to be. Um, so I think that uh, I was kind of alluding, this, uh, alluding to this earlier, but how does, you know, verifiable credentials, decentralized identifiers, NFTs, and et cetera, all work together? That's being figured out right now by a lot of exciting projects. Um, how do you canonically go from verifiable credential to an NFT? Do you need witnesses that read it and stamp it to the blockchain? You know, do you need, is there some kind of zero knowledge proof we can use for that automatically? You know, these are open questions right now. <laughs> and uh, speaking of zero knowledge proofs, these are some really interesting ones that I think are really gonna change the game for decentralized identity. Uh, group signatures are amazing because they allow us to achieve selective disclosure even off chain. So if you have you know, your mobile driver's license represented as a verifiable credential, you're able to just share some certain fields and not all of them, depending on the use case, right? And that's really valuable and possible using short group signatures. Uh, with decentralized oracles, DECO, uh, really cool. If you haven't heard about it, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it stands for decentralized oracle. I believe it came out of research from IC3, and now I think some folks are continuing that work at Chainlink, but basically, um, it allows you to uh, create a blind notary for any TLS connection so that you can uh, get an attestation for the data integrity that your browser got. Meaning that if you use this you know, customized browser because you have to do a special dance on the client side, the server just sees a normal TLS client, but basically um, you're able to get an attestation that you were served you know, your bank account balance from Wells Fargo, and if you dig into the HTML element, you can figure out the email associated, the last four of the account number, and you know, also the balance, right? You can demonstrate that to anyone that it came from the X509 cert from the Wells Fargo server, right? And that's really powerful, because it means that we just had data liberation for anything you wanted, so that you could access with your browser. So I'm really excited for that technology to come to maturity. And one really interesting one is accumulators, allowing us to scale issuance and revocation. One of the big issues, and you know, blockchains could be part of the solution here with um, respect to um, verifiable credentials and off-chain attestations, how do you know if it's still valid, right? You always have to figure out what revocation is when you issue a credential. So basically, uh, there are some like privacy not great ways to do it, such as a revocation list, maybe over HTTPS, you just you know, pull a list of the stuff that's still valid or not. Um, and that's kind of bad because you just have to list everything that expired, right? Then we can look at some models like OCSP that um, a lot of the certificate authorities are using. And uh, we can see a slightly privacy better way, but cryptographic accumulators can give us the potential to be privacy preserving um, and also figure out what's revoked or not. So these are some of the really interesting technologies, I think part of the roadmap ahead for Web3 Identity. And yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this. Thanks for your attention.